Now, um, <clears throat> please notice my email address. Uh, if there isn't the chance for exchange here after this talk or during the conference, it's always great to hear from you. Uh, and uh, it's actually very easy even to contact me if you don't take this down because you just go to UCLA EDU uh, and look up uh, NAGY. And I am the last NAGY in the directory. There used to be a, a fellow in the biology department called Kenneth Naj, which I always thought was a wonderful coming together of Scottish and Hungarian. Um, but he's now retired, so I don't think he's listed anymore. So uh, it will always be great to hear from you if you have any comments or questions or, or anything you think I should, I should know. Um, I, later on in the talk, I'm going to be showing some illustrations from uh, the book title, The Celtic Dragon Myth. Uh, illustrations, paintings that were done by Rachel Ainsley Grant Duff, uh, who um, uh, contributed some, some marvelous paintings to this particular rather peculiar project. Uh, I, I, I couldn't help, given that I am currently interested in dragons and, and giving this talk where I'm giving it to, uh, to bring the Celtic uh, the dragon myth into the picture. Um, it is based upon materials by uh, John Francis Campbell that he never got around to publishing. Uh, and then as um, worked up, as commented on, as uh, perhaps massaged, uh, by George Henderson, uh, whose voice is the primary one you hear in this uh, rather remarkable collection of things. It includes a translation of the medieval Irish text, the Toynbal Frich, uh, the Cattlerate of Froich. It also contains a translation of the Scottish Gaelic lay of Froich, or Frich. Um, it also has a fascinating pastiche of a folktale that presumably Campbell put together uh, involving various um, heroes who are engaged in dragon slaying. Uh, this is what Henderson has to say, especially about that particular uh, text, which is included in translation. And I will just read this to you. Uh, Between the years 1870 and 1884, the late Mr. J.F. Campbell of Islay was repeatedly attracted by a series of legends current in the highlands and isles which made special appeal to him as a storiologist. I love the phrase, storiologist. Uh, after reading a dozen versions of the stories, he found that no single title fitted so well as that of the dragon myth. Quote, it treats of water, egg, mermaid, sea dragon, tree, beasts, birds, fish, metals, weapons, and men mysteriously produced from sea gifts. All versions agree in these respects. They are all water myths and related to the slaying of water monsters. Um, as as um, eccentric as that might sound, that final characterization, it actually uh, works quite well with, with perhaps what I'm going to present to you. <clears throat> uh, a recent work, which I will mention again in the paper, but which uh, I, I want to single out here, <clears throat> comes from a professor of classics at Exeter. This is uh, Daniel Ogden's Dracon, Dragon Myth and Serpent Cult in the Greek and Roman Worlds, published uh, last year, I believe, by Oxford. It's a, a beautiful, very expensive book, um, but it basically covers uh, an extraordinary range of material from uh, ancient Greek and Latin sources uh, about the figure of the Dracon, of the dragon, or various serpent-like monsters, and maybe even not necessarily monstrous monsters, but uh, unusual creatures. Um, has anyone met him, by the way? He, he, he seems to be rather active in the field of classics, but with this he actually has leaped onto the stage of, of comparative mythology. And there's a, there's a other volume, a companion volume to this, which is essentially a reader in uh, classical texts and also some late antique texts, including hagiography. Uh, having to do with, uh, with, with dragons, and St. Patrick comes into the mix as well. Now, um, since this is, after all, a conference on, on myth, um, I thought it would be a good idea to, uh, to talk a little bit first about myth and my own definition of myth. Um, only fair to give you some sense of, as it were, where I am coming from. And uh, this will unfold. Um, so he, here is a definition. It's not particularly distinctive. 
Uh, I think you would characterize it probably as an anthropological definition of myth. Um, but, uh, but let's give it a try. So, um, myth is a story or a story pattern that is pervasive and persistent in a given time and place among a given group of people. Such stories uh, reflect like a regular mirror and refract like a distorting mirror the basic traits and values of a culture. Uh, they are told, performed, and transmitted uh, in a special and stylized way. And they feature a shared repertoire of themes, motifs, characters, and narrative procedures. In sum, a myth is a story that a society unmistakably marks as important for the members of that society to know. Stories, and plenty of them from the Celtic peoples, are, as indicated above, to be found in the texts contained in medieval and early modern manuscripts produced in Ireland, Wales, Scotland, Cornwall, and Brittany, as well as in the oral repertoires of traditional Celtic storytellers of the 19th and 20th centuries. Many of them, however, do not constitute what scholars of folklore and mythology would characterize as myth. This term, myth, from the ancient Greek word mythos, already amply attested in Homer, which originally meant something spoken with authority, is understood and used by folklorists, anthropologists, and other scholars in ways that differ significantly from the world's popular usage. How often in everyday speech do we hear the word used to designate a proposition, not even necessarily a story, that the speaker wishes to dismiss as a falsehood and a fantasy? For example, the idea that all women want to get married is a myth. And yet scholars who study myth as an expression of cultural values and aspirations use the term to mean something quite the opposite. Namely, a story, historically true or not, that articulates in narrative fashion a community's understanding of the world, its role in that world, and the origins of the basics of human life as articulated by the culture in question. Myth offers an insider's analysis of a society's most important institutions, such as war, marriage, and religion, and a social mission statement, laying out the priorities of life for members of society. Such stories, and here I'm not just talking about the Celtic context, but also about uh, myth in general, such stories are not trivially treated or carelessly transmitted from one generation to the next within the group, but are privileged as important, even essential to social existence in various ways. For example, what scholars would call myths in many societies are told only in particular highly ritualized contexts by specialists, or the language of myth is often different from everyday speech, or the words, events, or characters of myth are pointedly commemorated in a multimedia fashion, that is, in media other than the spoken word, such as visual, dramatic, or written forms. The techniques adopted by a culture for presenting, performing, disseminating, and preserving its myths are designed to reflect that these stories are serious business and convey cultural truths, which are not necessarily the same as objective truths. While what myths present to and inculcate in their audience is often based on observed phenomena, the messages that myth impart in parts uh, are more ideological than scientific, more lived, believed, or intuited from a particular society's perspective than logically demonstrable and self-evident. Given the constructive aspects of myth, the way it reflects an ongoing collective act of trying to cope with the challenges and difficulties that confront us all if we consider the puzzle of our existence both in general and in detail, we might have the impression that myth serves to uphold a status quo, reducing the problems that humanity encounters in living its life and in thinking about those problems down to straightforward or even simple statements and solutions. This notion of myth is in part what has led to the popular usage mentioned above, whereby myth is supposed to refer to an unrealistically reductive approach to a complex problem. That is, the sense of myth as an opium for the masses fiction or a substitute for serious thinking and doing. In fact, the spiraling, restless tendency of myth ensures that a mythology will develop its own intellectual dynamic and even become the means for members of society, as either the tellers or the audience of myth, 
to question the very propositions upon which the mythology and even the culture itself are based. Myth as a problem-solving process leaves no stone unturned in the narrative universe it weaves, and more often than not, myths find, uh, myth finds and highlights inconsistencies and contradictions in that system. Furthermore, the balance sheet for a mythology would probably show more problems created than solved by generation after generation of mythmakers in search of formulations and solutions that might connect the dots and work for the mythmakers themselves and for the other members of society who are listening. So, um, with, with that manifesto, so to speak, um, I would uh, now proceed to uh, consideration of some what I would consider mythological material in uh, medieval Irish literature, and perhaps even beyond medieval Irish literature. Um, you'd think from that manifesto then we could say happily, as some of us have, that what we find, for example, in uh, medieval Irish culture about, for example, of, uh, the Sons of Meal and uh, the, the notion of a series of takings or invasions of Ireland as recorded in the Lover of Alla Erin, uh, that that also constitutes myth, even if in fact it is myth that was invented in the medieval period by uh, perfectly Christian uh, literati. Um, I have no problems with using the term myth to refer uh, to materials that are not quote-unquote pagan, uh, that are not pre-Christian, and that are in fact very contemporary with the texts in which we find them. However, as uh, I think we also uh, can infer from that manifesto, um, myths tend to recycle pre-existing myths. So that in fact uh, it, it is not easy to find a completely invented myth which is not based upon earlier materials. Um, furthermore, it is uh, perfectly understandable that in looking at myth at any given period, we might well be interested in what was already there before that particular period, and what are the elements that are being recycled, what are the elements that persist uh, within this culture, within this body of story, over a period of time. So I am sympathetic, and in this paper I am very sympathetic, to the idea that while we are looking at what is undoubtedly the work of Christian literati from early and later medieval Ireland, that in fact we might find in this some, dare I use the expression, waifs and strays uh, of earlier tradition, um, but it's not that they are necessarily fragmented. They have been uh, recycled, they have been incorporated, and in many cases I think they've also been attached to their previous connections. Uh, so that, in fact, we can find um, uh, traces of an earlier mythology in later mythology. And I bring this up because uh, I think in, in, in talking about dragons, we have, we have a fascinating case of that. Uh, those of us familiar with medieval literature, those of us familiar with medieval culture know that dragons were, were in fact, still a part of the popular imagination, uh, that these are not uh, archaic creatures necessarily. Um, we find them mentioned in texts, hagiographic texts, uh, as the sort of beings that sometimes even saints encountered not that long ago. Um, a very famous example of a possible dragon in medieval uh, literature is what we find in The Life of Columba by Adovnan uh, in regard to Loch Ness. Uh, heaven knows a tradition that lives on till today. Um, I'm not going to be talking about uh, 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 the, uh, the Columban uh, water monster, um, but one can see that, in fact, dragons are still around. On the other hand, uh, dragons also have a venerable pedigree. Uh, and if we look at the study of, of Indo-European mythology, of that particular branch of comparative mythology, we find that there are dragon-like creatures in various Indo-European cultures. Casting our net even further, we find that in fact there are creatures we could describe as dragons, even though the vocabulary might change, in all kinds of non-Indo-European cultures as well. And in fact, they are still to be found in the popular belief and storytelling of many cultures today. Um, so we, we are looking at some, so a creature that definitely has been uh, recycled and that is still in some ways with us. Now, where do we find dragons? Well, um, in, in the medieval Irish context, 
I would argue that we find them especially in what we, I would call transitional texts. And the concept of transitional text is one that is uh, no doubt familiar to those of you who have been keeping up with oral tradition studies. Uh, there was, of course, the great classic by one of my uh, revered teachers, uh, Albert Bates Lord, the singer of tales in 1960, where he's looking at Balkan uh, epic singing. Um, and uh, Lord brings up the issue of transitional text. That is a text which is somewhere between oral tradition and written tradition. And Lord in 1960 is very skeptical of, of this concept of a transitional text. In fact, he, he doesn't so much dismiss the transitional text, but he, transmit, uh, he dismisses the concept of there being a transitional author of a transitional text, someone who is combining both oral and written modes of composition and ways of thinking about storytelling in particular. Uh, we move forward to 1986 and to an article that Lord published in the journal Oral Tradition, uh, edited by the late John Foley. And there we find that now, in fact, Lord is coming to accept begrudgingly the concept of a transitional text, um, in part uh, because he has hung out so much over the intervening years with medievalists, uh, who have in fact found the concept of traditional transitional text to be quite useful. And then uh, we, we have the, the, the final flowering of Lord's work, uh, his, his last sort of completed project, uh, The Singer Resumes the Tale. Um, and in that, Lord actually dedicates a chapter to the transitional text, where he includes under transitional text some things that uh, maybe even those of us who think that transitional text is a useful uh, heuristic model might find a little bit much. Uh, so he talks about Italo Calvino's retelling of Italian folktales as an example of a transitional text. But he also talks about more conventionally understood transitional texts, as in texts that bring together uh, uh, oral traditional techniques and written techniques, um, especially from medieval cultures, and even in some cases from post-medieval cultures, especially from emerging nations. So uh, I, I don't feel that I'm betraying uh, a dear teacher of old of mine in talking about transitional texts, but I also appreciate that, in fact, uh, transitional is a, is a somewhat uh, tricky concept, which perhaps we'll have the opportunity to discuss. Now, in, in looking at dragons and transitional texts uh, in early Irish literature and even in later medieval Irish literature, uh, I, I've come across a conceit, and so what you are going to hear now is basically uh, the result of that conceit. First, just a bit of bibliography for us. Um, there are three texts that will be the foci of this part of the presentation, uh, and the one of them is uh, the story of Fergus MacLeodia, uh, as uh, uh, it is included as a leading case, according to Binchy, um, in an early Irish law tract. This is arguably the chronologically earliest of our three extant texts. And uh, there's some very important commentary on this particular text and on this term, Mordrish, that pops up in it in Watkins' book, How to Kill a Dragon, uh, which I'm sure must have been part of the inspiration for the animated feature, How to Train a Dragon. Uh, but, of course, training a dragon is much more PC than killing a dragon. But uh, anyway, um, that text will figure in what I'm about to discuss. There is also uh, the, uh, uh, the late Old Irish, early Middle Irish, uh, Toynbo Freuch, um, edited by Wolfgang Maid, um, which is now available on the Celt website. Um, and uh, here I have to mention an article by um, one of my... Uh, of so role models, if I could ever aspire to the things that he has done, uh, Donald Meek, and his wonderful two-part article on the Toynbofrech uh, that was published in CMCS back in the 80s, which is a wonderful survey of the complexities, not just of that particular text, but also of various other texts uh, that we have concerning the figure of uh, Freuch and his adventures. And uh, third, but certainly not least, though chronologically uh, um, the latest, uh, is the Toriach Yermada Agus Ronya, or TDG for short, just as Toynbo Frick will be TBF for short in what follows. Um, this this uh, wonderful text, 
which still deserves a great deal of attention, by the way. Um, uh, just a, a bibliographic fun fact. Uh, Tommaso Cassi had uh, written a nice survey of this text, um, which was published uh, in Maynooth, um, and in his new book, which came out from Notre Dame Press, which is essentially a Kleine Schriften collection of Thomas Ocasi's greatest hits, uh, you will find a translation of his Gaelic text uh, into uh, English and also the original Gaelic text where he talks about TG TDG. It's a very uh, useful introduction to the text, which our students certainly can use. Um, there's also a, a fascinating article by Quivine Brenach uh, that was published in the Gaelic uh, Finn tradition, um, where he talks about uh, Nihay's edition and talks about some fascinating variants which didn't make it into Nihay's uh, uh, edition, and we'll, we'll get back to that later on. And uh, just, just to give you some color here, uh, these are rowan berries, which will figure in what we are uh, going to be looking at. And uh, these are slows, and these two will figure later on. Now, uh, for the rest of this presentation, I, I just have made copies of the wonderful paintings that I mentioned earlier that grace uh, the Celtic dragon myth book. Uh, and I will show these randomly if I remember to do so. If I don't remember to do so, we can uh, stay with this one, which I think is perhaps the best. Uh, this is the, the sort of Andromeda figure in that pastiche of a folktale that is included in the book, uh, who is waiting to be rescued before the nasty uh, dragon comes along and, and swallows her. And she seems quite dejected, doesn't she? And, uh, is perhaps worrying that the hero will not arrive in time. So uh, she can be sort of the mascot uh, for this presentation. So the dragons of this talk are both literal and metaphorical. As we shall see, there are real dragons, or the closest that Irish narrative tradition comes to them in the stories we are about to consider. As metaphor, however, a dragon refers to kinds of pre-modern Irish text, such as those that we will be exploring, which are transitional between oral and literary, and in which we are likely to find traces of pre-Christian Celtic mythology, or in which we find old story patterns and characters recycled, rehabilitated, and refitted to suit the expressive needs of a new Christian era. The dragon, a creature to be found both east and west, in ancient literature as well as medieval, not to mention modern belief and ritual, traditionally sports features that make it well suited to represent this kind of text. And at this point, uh, speaking comparatively of the delicate subject of what dragons are, have, and do, <clears throat> I would like to once again uh, acknowledge the recent work of Daniel Ogden and also mention a, uh, a wonderful <coughs> resource that came out in 2008 from ABC Clio, uh, the Handbook of Chinese Mythology, and the article by Li Hui Yen uh, on dragon in that particular source for something outside the Indo-European kin. First and foremost, a dragon, like most monsters, virtually by definition, is a hybrid part serpent, sometimes part fish or bird or terrestrial animal, and part sui generis. So to the transitional text, whether a case study inserted into an old Irish law tract, an early Middle Irish heroic saga, or an early modern Irish romance. In other words, the texts on which we will be focusing in this paper. Um, so too, a transitional text is hybrid because it employs oral traditional elements in its composition and or delivery, and yet is also a written document. Moreover, the author of a transitional text is just that, an author, but also a storyteller, and very possibly in some cases, a performer. To push the analogy further, dragons are not only hybrids, but are generated by and highly susceptible to transformation. Old Norse literature, for example, famously bears witness to a dragon that originally was a human, and brother to another human who perhaps just as remarkably could change himself into an otter in the story of the dragon slayer Sigurd. In one of the Irish texts, the third in chronological order we will be examining in this presentation, namely TGG, um, we find a monstrous serpentine beast, a dragon, who starts out in life as a tiny lar larva or worm on a slow, 
swallowed by a pregnant woman suffering from pica. Similarly, our texts, or the stories they tell, proceeded in the history of the medieval Irish literary tradition to morph into other forms pertaining to other genres, while arguably our texts themselves most likely emerged as the products of breakthrough metamorphoses in the development of medieval literary forms. The chronologically first of our texts, this text that our editor Daniel Binchy calls a legal case concerning a legendary king of the province of Ulster named Fergus <coughs> MacLeodia, was succeeded by a full-fledged example of the genre of the Adath, the death tale, in late medieval Irish, far removed from the earlier texts grounding in archaic Irish law. This later telling of the death of Fergus, uh, and this is, mind you, this is not Fergus MacRoy, this is Fergus MacLeodia, um, so this later telling of his death was edited and translated in Standish Hayes O'Grady's um, Silva Gedelica. Um, this is, however, a text sorely in need of a new edition. So if you, uh, you are encouraging students to think of good text to edit, this would be a wonderful one for which we would all be grateful uh, to see it in a new edition. Our text that lies chronologically in the middle, the Toinball Freuch, the TBF, Cattle Raid of Freuch, nominally a Toin, Cattle Raid tale, is, is succeeded in the late Middle Irish period by a Tochvark, a wooing tale, featuring the same hero, but with different characters, though in a plot comparable to what we find in TBF. Even more strikingly emblematic of the transformativity of these transitional texts is the existence of a late Middle Irish poetic version of the TBF, which James Carney edited in Celtic of Two. Um, Donald Meek, in that two-part survey I mentioned before, has proposed that this metrical version of TBF, which is a somewhat inaccurate way to describe it, but let's call it that, he's proposed that this was actually an implicit praise poem composed for a Connaught dynasty eager to be associated with this traditional hero. But the most significant indicator of the protean quality of the Freuch material and its various textual manifestations is the survival into the repertoire of Scottish tradition bearers as late as the second half of the 20th century of a lay of Freuch a ballad independent of the versification mentioned above, and a reshaping or perhaps restoration of the story of Freud as it is told in TBF that results in a tragic as opposed to a happy ending. And as I'm sure most of you know, this lay is already to be found in the book of the Dean of Lismore. Our text number three, TG, TDG, uh, the, uh, the Pursuit of Dermot and Grania, coming from the end of the medieval period of Irish literary history, belongs to a similarly complex textual lineage that weaves in and out of oral and literary tradition in both Ireland and Scotland. This prose romance climaxes in a fully developed scene taking place in a rowan tree that also exists in a poetic lay form already attested in the Duanera Finn, a 17th century Irish collection of lays put together by Irish men of letters in exile in a manuscript not much later than the earliest Irish manuscript witness to TDG. While only elliptically alluded to in early Irish literature, as if this were a story judged to be best left in its subliterary lair, the tale TDG tells, or rather the various distinct episodes it narrates, have enjoyed a healthy shelf life in oral tradition, as the evidence of place names and the cache of stories about Dermot and Grania, folklorists of recent centuries have collected a test. Given the interface between oral and written tradition, our transmission, our texts reflect, particularly TBF and TDG, it would be foolhardy to claim, as some have, that what seem to be transformations or multiforms of any one text or the material it contains can be explained simply in terms of literary filiation and the vagaries entailed in scribal enterprise or plain error. Uh, this, for example, was the underlying thesis of James Carney's still very influential treatment of TBF and related texts in his studies in Irish literature and history, uh, 1955. And at this point, I, I, uh, I have to bow to the memory of James Carney and um, put my disagreement with him this way. Yeah, absolute brilliant um, connecting of texts, uh, but the problem of when, when Carney sees a connection between texts, he thinks it's a matter of one author having imitated another author. So I don't think there's a sufficient appreciation 
of the idea of repertoire of patterns and motifs uh, to which storytellers, whether they are oral or written within a particular uh, tradition, have access. But again, I, I doff my hat to Carney because some of the connections he's making uh, in, in his work, especially in the 1955 book, uh, are, are just very, very illuminating and they, they show the way, I think, to a better understanding of the texts. Let me emphasize the conclusion arrived at by most scholars who have approached medieval Irish texts without a preset bias against what they would call a nativist approach to understanding them. Namely, the conclusion that these and the majority of vernacular texts that have survived from medieval and early modern Ireland bear the imprint of frequent and productive exchange between oral and written tradition on the level of transmission as well as composition, and that variation and seeming innovation cannot automatically be attributed to a literary agenda or aesthetic sensibility artificially insulated from oral tradition. In addition to hybridity and transformativity, here are a third and a fourth characteristic of dragons that I propose are good to think with vis-a-vis -vis our texts. Dragons are famous guardians. Let's see if we can find one of the dragons here. Oh, that's the mermaid. Here we go. Uh, again, it's a very, uh, more like a faux medieval <laughs> representation of a, of a hero in a Gallic folk tale. Uh, but there you at least see the, uh, the dragon. Uh, dragons are famous guardians, standing fiercely between items of value and us humans, and ready to attack our stand-ins in the narrative who are bold enough to try to take away these items, whether out of necessity or ambition. Because they block the pathway to what we and or heroes want to possess, but also because dragons, as will become clear, have a special connection with the sense of sight, Dragons are conspicuous, fascinating even. It is in this ability to entrance that lies much of the dragon's advantage over would-be opponents, more so in many instances than in its fierceness, fieriness, or other destructive powers. While it would be going too far to call them our own monsters, the three transitional texts on view in this paper have certainly cast a spell of fascination over generations of scholars of medieval Irish literature having served as the hardly docile objects of extensive critical attention for well over a century. <coughs> Not surprisingly, for these are guardian as well as transitional texts, um, and the scholarship centered on them has tended to pose big questions, more so than work on most other survivors from the medieval Irish scriptorium. Big questions having to do with the mechanics of composition in the literary tradition of Ireland in the Middle Ages, the extent of artistic license, the tradition allowed the author-storyteller to reshape or even refuse traditional material, substituting in its place invented or imported motifs and patterns, and the survival or extinction of Indo-European mythology in medieval Irish texts. Each of our texts, as I've indicated, features a dragon or dragon-like creature, each hard to miss or avoid as it watches over its designated treasures. In the Fergus text, the latter takes the form of the waters of a special inlet or lake. In TBF, which features a dragon in each of its two parts, which as Carney and others have noted, don't really seem to fit together. Uh, in each of its two parts, uh, there is a treasure that a dragon is, is protecting. In the first part, it's a rowan tree replete with delectable berries. And then in the second part, an alpine fort of marauders, recently returned with a fresh haul of booty, including the hero's wife and children. And, uh, and I bet this is the story that is uh, least well known of these, a and in TDG, in this particular episode, almost like an external soul, the dragon guards the life of the man who had served as the dragon's host when it was still a parasitic worm accidentally dwelling inside his head. How appropriate, then, that the modus vivendi, kinship, and nomenclature of these creatures have played no small role in attracting scholarly attention to the texts in which they guard their diverse treasures, as well as the answers to questions we have yet to answer about the nature of medieval Irish texts. The designation of Fergus's aquatic nemesis, for example, as Mordrish, the word you saw earlier on a previous slide, a hapax legomenon, caught the late Calvert Watkins' eye, which detected in the drish 
an Irish cognate to Greek drakon, and a derivation in both cases from Indo-European derk, I sight. Hence, the dragon is a creature that sees maleficently, or the seeing of which has dire consequences for the seer. The classical Greek figure of the Gorgon and the perennially popular basilisk, even in Harry Potter, uh, do and should come to mind. That this monster that Fergus encounters in the deep is the poster monster for all the creatures we are meeting today in the realm of medieval Irish storytelling, and the one with the closest etymological correspondence to a dragon, is fitting, given what the Morthrish actually does in the story. When Fergus, the king of Ulster, abuses his supernaturally granted ability to swim underwater like a fish by entering the one body of water into which his supernatural benefactors had forbidden him to plunge, he encounters this monster, so horrific in appearance that Fergus's face, in reaction to the sight, becomes horrifically distorted as well. He leaves the water with the monster untouched and returns to his men, unaware of what has happened to his appearance. The disfigurement, however, is so extensive and so permanent that it imperils Fergus's continued functioning as king. But his advisors, satisfied with his kingship and wishing to keep him on the throne, agree never to tell Fergus about his misfortune, nor to allow him ever to wash his own face, lest he see it reflected in the water. And you know this isn't going to work, right? <laughs> All is well until one day Fergus acts rudely toward the slave woman assigned the task of washing him. In the later text mentioned above, it is Fergus's own wife whom he insults and who then takes her revenge. And he is told about the appearance of his face by the woman and the lie that his continued kingship has become. No longer kept from seeing the monstrous horror into which he himself has been transformed, Fergus returns to the loch and bravely goes mano a mano with the monster and slays it, though apparently at the cost of his own life. More on this later. But the story as told in our text does not really revolve around this action-packed conclusion, but rather on the scene of visual contact is made between Fergus, the submariner, and the Drish of the Deep, the sight of whom echoes doom, etches doom on the king's visage or exposes a weakness in the heroic profile of this royal taboo breaker. Unlike the self-adulating turn inward, the experience of seeing his face mirrored in the water induces in the Narcissus of classical mythology, Fergus's coming eye to eye with himself impels him back to his secret sharer, the dragon, and incites him to engage in prolonged underwater combat that in the end produces for those gathered anxiously on the shore the spectacle, and it must have been a spectacle, of a body of water the surface of which stays red with blood for a whole month afterwards. In TBF, the vocabulary of monsterhood, not as suggestive as in the Fergus text, settles for the Latin borrowing pest from bestia and the vague native word meal, animal or beast. Even so, in the case of the monster featured in the first part of the text, the beast Freuch encounters while swimming across a pond, the narrative build up to their life and death confrontation works very hard to achieve a striking visual impact in a text that, even apart from the scene, this scene, abounds in highly descriptive, sometimes even quasi-3D effects. Having been asked by his murderously-minded prospective father-in-law to fetch rowan berries from the tree on the other side of the pond, in which Freuch was already swimming, our hero, without being told that a monster lurks nearby, in fact, Eilil, that uh, prospective father-in-law, downright lies and says, no, we've never heard anything interesting about this particular pool, uh, so go ahead and swim around in it. So without his having been told that there is a monster in it, Freud first succeeds in eluding the beast's attention and returning with a particularly tasty batch of berries. His both aesthetically thrilling and sensually arousing appearance as he swims back across the pond is a veritable epiphany for the girl he loves and who loves him and for those to whom she will henceforth pass along the story. And here I, I read in George Henderson's elegant translation from the Celtic dragon myth. And the remark of Finnever, the daughter of Alil, whom Freud had come to woo, was, is that not beautiful that ye see? 
Beautiful she thought it was to see Freuch over the black lin, the body of great whiteness, the hair of great loveliness, the face so well formed, the eye of deep gray, and he a tender youth without fault, without, uh, without blemish, with his face small below and broad above, his build straight and flawless, the branch with the red berries between the throat and the white face. Finever was wont to say that she had not seen aught that would come up to him half or third for beauty. Surely this scene and the girl's reaction to whom she sees, the opposite of the monstrous, although Freud is soon to catch the eye of a monster, we can legitimately place alongside the more famous scene in the Middle Irish account of the tragedy of Deirdre, the most beautiful girl in Ireland who, seeing a flayed calf lying on the snow with a raven perched on it, declares that she will accept no mate whose colors do not match those before her. Given the impact the sight of the waterborne Freuch with the berries has upon the girl, and maybe even her father, Ilo's request for an encore, that the hero swim across again and bring more berries, would be understandable, even if his intention were not to make sure that the monster finally notices the invasion of his lair and the plundering of his fruity treasure. The outcome of the deferred but inevitable encounter as narrated in TBF between hero and monster leaves the monster dead and the hero gravely wounded and in need of the special healing only his supernatural kinfolk can provide. He does, however, survive. In the lay mentioned above, he does not. In the episode from TDG, which features perhaps the most grotesque monster we are viewing today, the creature at whatever stage of its unwholesome growth is consistently referred to as a cruv or knuv, an Irish word cognate with Welsh priv, uh, insect or small creature, and Persian kerm, worm, and derived from an Indo-European variant of the word that gives us Latin wermis and English worm and Old English orum, the last two frequently used specifically in reference to monstrous worms or dragons. The violent releasing of the cruv from Kian's head uh, certainly makes a visual splash and a spectacular sequel to its gestation as a conspicuous bump on Kian's head. We have this hero uh, named Kian, whose mother at one point desperately wanted to have some slows. And uh, her husband, and uh, this is also named Ilil, but he's a monster Ilil, um, gets her the slows. And then um, without it being explicitly said, obviously there is something about the slows or something that was on the slows that affects uh, the pregnancy so that when uh, she gives birth to uh, her son named Kian, as he grows up, uh, there's a bump on his forehead, which just grows bigger and bigger. And he's very embarrassed about it, so he typically swaddles his head. Um, and he's very, very picky about who gets to shave him or to cut his hair. And in fact, uh, he slays the people whom he invites to, uh, to give him his, his trim. Um, this goes on until finally he encounters a member of Finn's Fian, uh, who decides not to be a patsy. Uh, and so after he's given a shave to Kian, he asks about the bump, uh, which he sees because the head has to be unswaddled for this procedure to be successful. Um, and uh, Kian doesn't tell him, probably doesn't know. And so uh, the, the Fenian hero, Scothan, takes out a knife and slashes the bump, uh, at which, in a scene reminiscent of uh, something from Ridley Scott's film Alien, <coughs> this, this worm, this, this Kruv, leaps out uh, and uh, starts its life outside of its host um, in a way that we'll discuss in a moment. Um, once it's outed, this, this worm, there's no hiding it. Uh, and the worm, instead of escaping, wraps itself around the head of a spear, rendering it a peculiar caduceus or Asclepian staff. The worm's subsequent, gro subsequent growth into a creature big enough to fill a house and a freakish exhibit worth visiting in particular by Kian's foster brother, makes it downright lethal. So uh, th this, this worm keeps on growing. It's not killed because mom says, no, let's not hurt it because in some way Kian's life might be connected with that of this worm. So we don't want Kian to die, so let's just keep this worm alive. But the, but the worm becomes quite a nuisance and uh, uh, very omnivorous and very monstrous. And uh, Kian's foster brother wants to take a look at it because he's heard about it. So he comes by and as he's looking at the monster, the monster uh, attacks him and, and uh, removes his leg 
The mutilation the worm inflicts upon the foster brother, who loses a leg, appears to be its response to the insult, insult of being the object of his victim's voyeuristic gaze. After this lashing out, even Kean's mother agrees that the worm has to be killed, no matter what the consequences for her son and his life. The attempt to burn the worm alive fails because it proves to be a spectacular leaper, a characteristic I note in passing it shares with both of the dragons featured in TBF. Soaring above Ireland, the Cruev finds refuge in a cave where it successfully hides from a world too scared to pursue it into its lair. Even Finn and his band of heroes, who constitute the majority of the cast of characters in TDG, and enjoy the reputation of being the ones to call on when any kind of monstrous creature has to be stopped or slain, even they are said to avoid the vicinity of the worm's cave. The story of the worm, as originally told by Oshin in the text, ends with the monster still alive. In the present of the narrative, when the story as told by Oshin is now retold by Dermot, the latter hero storyteller does provide an ending. We learn that he to whom Oshin told the story, the young hero Conan, not to be confused with the, uh, with the nasty Conan, this is a different Conan, um, eager to pass this test in order to be accepted into Finn's band, succeeded in slaying the worm in the cave. But in a variant of the TDG text, discussed by Brennach in the article I mentioned earlier, Dermot adds the detail with more than a little pride that Conan was able to accomplish the deed only by borrowing Dermot's spear, which never misses its mark. The contributions, both the spear and the narrative coda, Dermot makes to the sequence of events he relays from another narrator and then brings to a conclusion with his own knowledge from hindsight of what happened, complicate the authorship of the story as they do the question of who after all should receive credit for having slain the worm. The narratological complexity that winds around the episode of the Kruiv in TDG brings us to the last point I'm going to make about the iconic function of dragons in our chosen texts. The fact that the worm tale is couched within a double narrative nest and left unresolved in regard to both who or what engendered the worm and who terminated it present a parallel to what happens in the story of Fergus MacLeitia as told in the old Irish text. Let us recall that the outcome of his initial encounter with the Morthrish the punchline to the story up to that point is an embarrassment that needs to be suppressed or replaced among the Ulstermen who want to keep Fergus as their king. The party line of nothing happened, move along, breaks down only when the social structure, the relationship between slave and master, or that between husband and wife ruptures, and the true ending of the story is let out. More accurately, only then can the story proceed toward the ending it should have that is, a rematch between Fergus and the dragon. Even the at long last realizable ending, however, leaves us with a hint of ambiguity. And let's just go to this final image here <coughs> of uh, music making and perhaps storytelling as well. Um, Fergus's final words in, in this text are, I am the survivor, uh, specifically of the fight with the dragon. And yet, he is said in the text to sink back into the water dead, Marv. Presumably, Fergus dies from the wounds inflicted upon him. But the questions still arise. Isn't he able to live underwater anymore? And hasn't he overcome the monstrous obstacle to his living under the waters of Loch Rothriga? Um, maybe I'm just reading too much of TBF into the story of the death of Fergus Magletia. But after all, if he comes up and says, I survived, uh, and then he disappears in the water. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean he drowns. Uh, he may be seriously wounded, but uh, you know, <coughs> maybe there's a certain note of ambiguity left there at the end about just what, in fact, happened to Fergus. This denouement takes us back to the similar ambiguity in TBF, where the pointedly difficult recovery of a half-dead Freud after his fight with the water monster and the oddity of his being returned from his convalescence by a troop of supernatural females who are said to be mourning, not rejoicing, give the impression of a text or storyteller aware of a different, grimmer ending, one that is in fact attested in another text, as we have seen. <coughs> 
I would argue that the presence of dragons in this text and the others we have examined leads to a heightened awareness of the potential complexities of narrative, especially in the fluid milieu of oral tradition, where multiformity and the coexistence of alternative tracks don't just happen, but provide the means of a story's survival and adaptation. That how to slay a dragon, to quote Watkins' title, entails the equally challenging matter of how to account for the slaying of a dragon, not just in the context of these particular Irish texts, or of transitional texts in general, which by definition are attempting to negotiate between sometimes incompatible mo modes of narration, but even in oral tradition as well, is inferable from the way the venerable folktale type ATU 300, named after the dragon slayer, usually plays out worldwide. The hero rarely has the opportunity to enjoy his triumph right away. Typically, in instances of ATU 300, he is beaten to the punch by an anti-hero who tells a false story of what happened and presents himself as the dragon slayer. This happens, for example, in uh, early continental accounts of Tristan and of Tristan wooing uh, Isolde in part by slaying a dragon. And that's, in fact, a rather important instance of AT3, ATU 300. Even in the relatively predictable world of the international folktale, where heroes, including dragon slayers, ultimately do live happily ever after, the confrontation with the monstrous brings to center stage the plasticity of story and its dependence on factors such as perspective and need and the importance of rhetoric for the art of the storyteller of the stakes involved in making the story as you tell it convincing and fulfilling for the audience. How much more so these issues impinge on the artistry of the author of a transitional text and how intimately the dragon is caught up in these issues, I hope has become clear in our journey through these three Irish tales. Thank you for your attention.